Hi. Welcome to this section on using the intermediate value theorem. I wanted to uh, illustrate a problem involving the intermediate value theorem and uh, this one comes straight out of your homework. It's like a problem 42 from section 1.5. And the problem is, if we're given the equation sine of x equals x squared minus x, the question is, does this equation have a solution on the interval for x between one and two. So when you see a problem like this, the, this is this is like the quintessential setup for the intermediate value theorem. Um, you have two endpoints, you got two functions, and you want to know. And and sine is a problem because uh, it's hard to estimate the values of sine. We know the value of a sine at some special angles. But in between, it's kind of a mystery, so um, we have to approximate. But using the intermediate value theorem, we can figure out whether or not this 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 equation has a solution, uh, regardless, and it's actually pretty easy. Okay, so I'm going to make this problem small and stick it up in the corner here. Um, so uh, before we go any further, it's a really good idea in a situation like this to uh, make some graphs to see what's to see what's really going on so let's just be thinking about a graph here so what do we know about x squared minus x so x squared minus x is really equal to x times x minus one which means that it's got roots at zero and one Okay. Um, it's also turning up, so we know that this function has to look something like this. Okay. This is what x squared minus one. We also know over here, so we know at one it's equal to zero. And what about two? Why two? Because that's the interval that we care about, one to two. So what happens at two? What's the value of this function at two? this function is equal to 2. Okay, So this this value up here is 2. Okay, And that's because we plug in 2 times 2 minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1 and 2 times 1 is 2. So we get that the function 0 here and 2 here. Okay, That's important. Now what about the sine function on approximately the same domain? In order to figure this out, what we really need to know is kind of where is pi over 2. And pi over 2 is something like, so pi over 2, which is where the sine function is its biggest, right? Sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1, which is here. Sine of pi over 2 is about there, right? That's 1. Um, so pi over 2 is about 3 halves, which is about here somewhere, okay? So that means that the sine function looks something like that. So based on our graph, um, it sure our little sketch. It sure looks like these these two functions cross, and they should cross somewhere between one and two, right? Okay. So that's also a good idea. We have every indication from the graph that this is the situation. So now let's let's get down to business. So let's look at, let's consider the function. So all, all we really have to do here is kind of start evaluating things, okay? And, and one of the ways to work is to, let's, let's look at the function. Let's rearrange this function a little bit. And let's look at our function f of x, which is sine of x minus x squared plus x. Okay? And when these functions are equal, 
this is when f of x is equal to zero, right? When f of x equals zero, we recover our original equation. So really we want to know, this is equivalent, our, our problem is exactly equivalent to knowing whether or not f of x is equal to zero somewhere. Okay, so how do we start? Well, let's look at f, let's look at f of one. What do we know about f of one? Well, we know that the sine of one, whatever, the, whatever that is, sine of one, one is an angle somewhere in the first quadrant between zero and pi over two, so sine is positive and it's bigger than zero, we know this. But look, look what happens to x squared minus x x squared minus x is equal to 0 at 1. So f of 1 is just sine of 1, which we know is strictly bigger than 0, because 1 is in the first quadrant. Okay, that's the argument. All right. So now, let's look what happens. What's the next value to consider? What about f of 2? f of 2 it's going to be equal to sine of 2, okay? 2 is a number that's somewhere between uh, pi over 2, which is 3 halves, and pi, which is 3. So 2 lies um, in the second quadrant, okay? And in, in the second quadrant, sine is still positive, and it's larger than 0. Um, now, what about x squared minus x? But certainly, sine of 2 is less than what? Sine of 2 is less than 1. We know this for a fact. Sine of 2 is less than 1 and it's bigger than 0. That's what we can say for sure. Okay. Now what about x squared minus x? Well we already figured out that x squared minus x, so what else do we have here? So we got minus 4 plus 2. Okay. So minus 4 plus 2 this equals sine of 2 minus 2. Okay, that's f of 2. And I think you would agree with me because sine here, we let's look upstairs here, sine of 2 is less than 1. 1 minus 2 is going to be negative. So we know that f of 2 is less than 0. It's negative. Okay. So we figured out that f of 1 is bigger than 0, and f of 2 is less than 0. So we now, now we use our theorem. Okay, now we use our theorem. And here's, here's how you would state that. Okay, so we know that f of 1, we've, we figured this out earlier, you can look through the calculation, f of 1 is bigger than 0 f of 2 is less than 0, which taken together by the intermediate value theorem, we know that this function, since f is a continuous function, ah, this is a crucial point, absolutely crucial, and I forgot to mention this, so continuous, right, continuous, you can't use the intermediate value theorem until you say the word continuous, and our function f, which is, where is our function f? Here is our function f. Let's make it big again. Beep, beep. Here's our function f. Okay? Our function f is a trig function, which is continuous, added together with a polynomial. Okay? This here, this here is a polynomial. The difference of two continuous functions is a continuous function. So f, therefore, is a continuous function. That, that's the only argument that you need to make, okay? F is a continuous function, and therefore, by the intermediate value theorem, you know that there has to exist a C. There has to be some number C between 0 and 1, okay? So there has to be a number C between 0, sorry, between 1 and 2, that's our domain, 1 and 2, where our function F of C is equal to 0. Because you can't have a function that's negative in one place and positive in another without it crossing the origin. Okay? And this shows you, therefore, that this equation does, in fact, have a solution, which is what our graph showed. But this theorem guarantees that that will happen. Our graph, maybe we were a little delirious when we drew it, or our lines are off, or our values are off, but by the intermediate value theorem, we know this is true. 
So there you go. That's a demonstration of the intermediate value theorem. Probably the most important part, um, which I didn't do a good job of explaining, I don't think, until the very end here, is that the f most important part is the continuous function bit. Our function f that we cared about is continuous. Okay, Therefore, we can use the intermediate value theorem. If your function is not continuous, you can't. Well, there's a the demonstration. Practice the other problems um, and ask me if you have any questions. Bye.